Hi folks and welcome back. This new series is going to be dedicated to all things related to scientific journal covers. So we're going to be covering two types of content here. The first will be breakdowns of some of my own covers. So along my journey as a science illustrator, making illustrations for papers and cover illustrations, I've picked up some cues that I use to guide my illustration workflow and I'd like to share these with you. The other type of content will be based on art created by other artists. Obviously, there are many other fantastic scientific illustrators out there, many of who, who have much more experience than me and have published way more illustrations than me. So I'd like to take the opportunity to highlight some of their amazing work through these episodes, discuss why I think their cover illustrations are so good, what we can learn from them, and where possible, even show how you can create similar things using Blender. In this first episode, I want to dissect a cover I made for Professor Carlos Grande and colleagues at KAUST, published earlier this year in Advanced Theory and Simulations. So starting from the ideation for the illustration and some of the thought processes that went behind it, I also want to talk a bit about my stylistic choices when it comes to image composition and color palette, as I think this is something people find quite difficult, but there isn't much information on this on YouTube. Obviously, these things really depend on personal preferences though, so I can only share my own thought processes. And then finally, I'm going to show you how my Blender scene actually looked like to create this cover illustration, so you can see exactly how everything was made, how the lighting looked, and so on. And hopefully all of these things together will be a useful starting point for anyone getting started making their own cover illustration. So with that covered, let's get started. So let's start with the context, the paper for this cover illustration, which is titled Predicting the Flow Behavior and Residence Time Distribution in Chemical Reactors, a Simplified and Fast Approach Using Smooth Particle Hydrodynamics. What this paper was essentially reporting was a new type of simulation to study how fluids pass through chemical reactors and not using computational fluid dynamics but a particle based simulation and so straight off the bat i already knew that the focus of the illustration was going to be highlighting how this simulation worked and the fact that it could handle two phases of fluids going through a packed bed reactor so usually when I go about creating a cover illustration, I try to get as many different references as possible. However, in this case, I actually only had one piece of reference image, and it was this picture from Advanced Functional Materials, which showed two liquids come together. And obviously the context is very different from what I was trying to illustrate, but I really quite like this idea of having two streams of liquids merging together and somehow interacting. So here's how the illustration evolved over the design process. As you can see, the idea didn't change very much, and the whole focus was to show the simulation but also in context. So the idea of putting the illustration of the simulation inside of real world things, so putting the packed baked structure that was simulated inside of a cutout of a reactor, and also showing this transition of real fluid into simulation particles. So you can see in draft number one, the image was taking on the feel of the inspiration, the reference image that I showed earlier of two fluids coming together. So a couple of things that did change over this design process. The first is that in the original draft, I thought about having this detector plane at the bottom of the reactor, which is meant to signify where the simulation detected different particles coming through the reactor. Uh, but we eventually got rid of this because it added a little bit too much complexity and detracted from the main message of the image. There was also a technical point that was not being conveyed in this version, which is that fluids not only need to enter but also exit the other side. One of the most important things is that one exits much faster than the other. And so this led to the second version of the illustration, where we had only one fluid coming in from the first inlet and the second fluid coming out. So let's talk a little bit about composition and color palette. Again, focusing on this specific example, there's a whole lot to talk about in terms of theory, but that's going to be maybe the topic of another future video. But in general, my ethos is I like to have whatever I want the viewer to latch their focus onto right in the middle of the image. So in this case, this is the reactor. And then what I like to do is compose the rest of the image to have elements that guide the viewer's eye towards the central part of the image. And the main workhorse for guiding the viewer's eye in this case is meant to be the orientation of the reactor and also the fluid that passes through. I usually find that these guiding elements, so to speak, are best placed along important composition lines on the image canvas and I really love using diagonals, so stretching from one top corner to the bo opposite bottom corner. To me, using this kind of composition automatically balances the scene really well. Also, if you combine it with some depth of field, which I've done here, you get this defocusing effect, and this gives an interesting perception of depth to the image and sort of an extra level of interestingness 
you'll actually notice that a lot of journal covers do this. Take a minute to look through some of these illustrations and hopefully you'll notice that they all employ an element of the diagonal, whether in the positioning of the elements in the image or for example playing with the perspective of the shot. One point to keep in mind though if you're using diagonals is that some journals, including the advanced series from Wiley, position their titles justified to the top corner of the cover illustration. So in this case I used the top left to the bottom right just because I knew that the advanced theory and simulations title would sit in the top right. And in general I find that using these composition guides, whether it's the diagonal or you could also use two thirds, halves, um, it's a simple way of getting the balance of the image to look okay without much effort. And if you're using Blender, Blender has uh, already pre-built composition guides that you can bring up to help you when you're constructing your shot. Of course though, to think about how you're going to compose the image, you already sort of need to know what kind of image aspect ratio is needed for the journal you're going for. So you need to always plan a little bit ahead. In terms of coloring, I really like to keep things simple. In this cover, there are only really two main colors, a prominent gold and a prominent blue, very vibrant colors, high saturation. And so they hopefully immediately grab your attention. To keep the colors relatively unbusy though, I've partitioned them into two separate halves of the image. To, if they were mixed up too much, I think it'll end up being quite busy. But by having the gold in the top and the blue in the bottom, it doesn't jar too much with the viewer. Also, the gold and blue combination is a relatively safe combination, color palette, to work with. Uh, that's because they sit on opposing sides of the color wheel. And having these two colors that fit really well together really fits also the scientific narrative. Again, that there being two phases used in the simulation that pass through this reactor. So with the artistic points out of the way, let's have a look at the actual Blender file I used to create this cover illustration. So there aren't really any complex elements in the scene. You have the reactor, you have bits of fluid. This is what you see at the corners of the image. And then you have the reactor with particles. So something quite neat about this illustration was that the authors were able to provide me with an actual SDL of the hat bed reactor that they use for the simulation together with all of the particles that were outputted from the simulation. So it's just a matter of importing these in and applying different materials. So I quite like the idea of having metallic looking balls. Next we have the reactor, which is really simple, nothing fancy. It was just modeled out of a cylinder that I sort of extruded a bunch of times to create the opening sections. It has a rough metallic material applied with a little bit of bump to give it some texture, but again, super simple. You'll also notice that the, the fluids here are also not a single stream, unlike what you might expect from the, the final render. The final render sort of looks like there is this continuous stream, but the liquid is made of individual sections that are sort of cobbled together. Very much a case of faking it till you make it. It really doesn't matter how you do it to make it look good in the final image. Perfection is not the key here. Whatever works, works. And to basically create these liquid trails, I didn't do any fancy simulations or anything. All I did was use metaballs, so I just did shift a metaball and it was just a case of shifty and duplicating and just sort of adding metaballs along to map out the part liquid that I wanted after I had a shape that I was roughly happy with uh, all I did was right click converted it to a mesh and then just manipulated the mesh in edit mode tweaking it to get the exact shape that I wanted so one key thing here in this illustration is that the stream of liquid slowly transitions to particles as it enters the reactor. And the way that I did this is by doing a little bit of geometry nodes. So what I did was I took the liquid as modeled by the metaballs as an input mesh, converted the mesh to a volume, distributed a bunch of points inside that volume, and then instance a bunch of particles with the same material as the rest of the liquid on those volume points. And then I joined it back together with the original input mesh. Then what I did was I applied a gradient shader, transitions from fully transparent inside of the reactor to gradually opaque as it exits the reactor to reveal the particles that are hidden inside. So there all I did was I took the object coordinates, took the, in this case, the X component of the position vector and just applied a color ramp, passed it into a mix shader and allowed it to transition from the metallic particle shading to a transparent BSDF. And that served as enough to sort of get this transparency gradient going. Just to sell the effect a little bit better, I also added a bunch of particles sort of funneling outwards here. This is also using the same geometry nodes idea of mesh to volume. In this case, the mesh is just a crudely modeled distorted cone that looks something like this. And the same is happening on the other side. In terms of lighting, there are a whole bunch of different lights here main ones to talk about. There is a global HDRI and this HDRI has a very strong top-down component to the lighting. So this is dark garage basically. To accentuate the top-down lighting even more, I had two further aerial lights. I had one directly above the reactor with a relatively high power and then I have a weaker one just behind the reactor 
and that's just to soften the shadows that would otherwise happen. Right, so if I toggle this light on and off, it is subtle, but it sort of adds just a little bit more lighting to the background. Besides that, there are a bunch of specific lights. I have one area light pointing in from the entry point of the reactor onto the particles that are entering. And if I don't have this light, you don't get enough illumination inside of the reactor to showcase all of this lovely stuff that's happening inside. Uh, that's just because the HDRI lighting gets blocked by the reactor casing. And so that's just one trick I use to have a directional bit of light with a really narrow spread, just narrowly pointing into the reactor. Also, I really don't recommend the way that I've done this in that the whole scene is flat, but I've done a combination of rotating the reactor and rotating the camera to fit everything in. Uh, there's a much neater way to do this but again just to emphasize that it really doesn't matter how you get to the final illustration so long as it works the scene sort of evolves organically and this was the way that i apparently decided to do it at the time one final thing obviously there is some depth of field going i have an empty position right at the center of the reactor and if i click on the camera you'll see that i have depth of field enabled with a relatively low f-stop to get a, a relatively aggressive defocusing happening on these little bits of liquid that are closer to the camera just to mention a couple of other things that I did in compositing, uh, very simple, I added a simple glare node set to fog glow, uh, but that just gives a little bit of the haze on some of the reflective elements of the uh, liquid metal. And I also added some lens distortion, making sure that you select fit, and all I've added is a little bit of chromatic dispersion, which you can see at the borders of the image. And that is basically it for how I went about making this cover illustration. Hopefully you found it useful as a reference point to get you started on making cover illustrations. Please leave a like and a comment, particularly with some feedback on this kind of content. If you found it good and you'd like to see more, any suggestions for cover illustrations that you'd like me to dissect could be mine or could be, again, other people's. As always, please subscribe for more content like this and I will see you all next time. Bye bye for now.